to another edition of the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the PAUK Radio Network. I'm your host, Paul Rook, and as always, I'm joined by the stupendous Kerry Greenaway and Richard Clements. Hello, guys. Yeah, you're still stupendous. Yes, we're yep. still there. We're yeah, still... you're stupendous this week. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, yeah. So so let's start with Kerry. What, what has your week been? Yes. Is all I can say to that. <laughs> the calm before the storm, surely. Hopefully. Hopefully it is. I don't know what's happened. It's almost like the world oh, I say the world. The UK, we've opened up. We're allowed to do stuff now. And from like, you know, we can go out for meals, we can see our friends and family indoors, not just outdoors, which is just as well because the weather is shockingly bad. <laughs> and then everybody seems to have stopped doing anything. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, they do, All this they... time we've been hankering to do stuff and now we can. Yeah. Or go to the shops and see something different other than food. Do you know what I mean? Now we can. People haven't. <laughs> yeah, it's because we spend so much time indoors now. We don't want to go out. We're institutionalised. Yeah, mm. that's it. Too late now. Yeah, maybe yeah, that is it. Sounds like yeah. that, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, but you know, we're. I'm sure things will pick up. Things will pick up. I mean, the weather's not actually helping. We are no. seem to be having a bit of unseasonal wet spot at the moment. You know, but apart from that, uh, once that brightens up, and we we'll, and we can go back to moaning about how hot it is. Oh, well, hopefully, because I'd like some summer this year. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know it's though. only May. I know we're we're only in May, but we're coming to the end of May, nearly June. Do you know what I mean? That's a little bit too much to ask. We get a little bit of sun. Yeah, maybe you know. it's maybe like a little bit of sun, Monday, a Monday afternoon, and then nothing until Friday afternoon as well. That, that'll do for summer. I can't cope with the two when it's too hot. <laughs> no, I like having all the doors and the windows open and the flies coming in. And... <laughs> yeah, but see, I have my doors and windows open anyway, and now yeah. it's cold. There are no flies coming in, so that suits me even better. No, I so I like warm. I like being warm. I don't yeah. like too hot, but I like warm. Oh no, I could quite easily live in the freezer. <laughs> you could, couldn't you? Yeah, well, very much so. I don't know, weirdo. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he's a bit weird, isn't he, Kerry? <laughs> he is, yeah, he is. Uh, he? Not at all. I, I mean, I, I had this discussion earlier with my parents, actually, because they, they keep saying that I'm always hot, which I am. I always feel hot. And they were like, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. And I was like, well, I'll tell you, it's my superpower. You know, like when Superman's powers dwindle, he has to go into the yellow sun to boost up his powers. Yeah. Well, yeah. what I do is when my power dwindles, I go to my mum's because that's, that's always like a furnace. So I pick up all the heat from there and then that lasts me for another six months. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, that, that's my superpower. Oh, right. Heat <laughs> storage. <laughs> Yeah, what would your superpower be, Richard? Well, mine, I don't know at the moment. I'd like to think being fit and strong and and healthy and running and <laughs> stuff like that. But uh, Oh, you Hercules. Yes. Yeah. I'm sort of, you know, the, the cycling and the walking I'm now doing is sort of starting to pay just a little bit of dividends. You know, I've, I've shaved a, a few pounds off the hips, I'm sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can fit my old trousers on, so that's so that's got to be a good thing. Well, going, going, in going the right back direction. A, yeah. Going back a few months, the only thing that had run would be your nose, I think, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I was yeah. built upside down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my nose runs and my feet smell. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't work it out. <laughs> So anyway, guys, what are we talking about on tonight's show? Well, we was we did have a guest lined up, but scatty old person that that guest is, is, is done a runner. Well, he hasn't done a runner. He just has totally forgotten. And, I and think, it, no, I think he's been abducted by aliens. Yeah, week. possibly. Ah. Yeah. Talking of which, I actually saw something um, on, right. This was something I saw on the socials. This is this is sort of how it's going to go tonight, guys. We're sort of like free flowing tonight. <laughs> I saw something on the socials that was quite interesting, actually. Now, 
um, you might have to correct some of the details, people out there who are listening, because I am doing this off the top of my head. But cow abduction and cow mutilation has been has been one that has always baffled me. Why? Why? Why would they want to do that? You know, in the same way as why would they want to abduct all these people over the years and, and nothing ever seems to, you know, evolve or move on from that. Anyway, the cow abduction thing. The theory was that the reason that they abduct cows and take bits of them, as it were, like the, the cattle mutilation, was because there's something called strontium in their milk, like their DNA. Right. And that the, and I'm going to air quote, aliens are measuring the levels of this strontium because that comes from the flora and the fauna that they eat, that they can take it, they can aliens can get a lot of information from taking bits of cow that they wouldn't be able to get. So why don't they take the whole cow is my argument. Why take a bit and then drop it back down to earth? Because apparently it's letting us know that that's what they're doing. Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, Cattle uh, mutilations. Uh, They were all the rage at one point. I mean, are they still going on? You know, sort of like usually from places like Utah in the United Mm. States. I mean, yeah, I I thought that they were down to um, they they put it down to creatures like the Chupacabra and things like that that Mm -hmm. would attack the animals of a night and drink their blood because some of them were found with puncture wounds in their neck and things like that. There is a bat, though, isn't there, that drinks blood? I don't think it... Yeah, I'm I, sure there's a bat. I, yeah, that'd be the... Wouldn't that be the vampire one in... Um, is he at Australia or... Oh, I, I don't know, but sort of like cattle mutilations are... To me, you know, it certainly is a, like a, an American phenomenon. I've never really heard it sort of much outside. I, I could possibly be wrong, but I've never heard it reported much outside the United States. I mean, I've certainly never heard of cases here. Mm. I would have thought there is cases here, but more, I would think, with sheep. Oh, yeah, possibly. I have sort of come across a few, but uh, they tend to be put down to uh, possible uh, big cats, don't they? Sort of yeah, because with, with the cryptozoology in this country, it is mainly big cats that we have. Yeah, that, that's sort of and like that, a, pho- uh, a phenom- ph- phenomena we have here. It is the alien big cats, which is quite a big thing. Yeah, but it's more plausible that they've escaped from zoos and... Even private collectors. Well, yeah, they sort of that, and that is the usual sort of uh, premise that comes up. But uh, we certainly uh, seem to be having a lot of sightings at the moment, North Wales and across into Cheshire. There's been, they do actually believe there is at least a lynx on the loose. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I did think that that had sort of been looked at more mm-hmm. in regards to um, an actual big cat rather than mm. anything else. But it's, but it's yeah. funny, really, because uh, the big cat sightings here seem to... I've, and I've been following them, and uh, sort of like since this lockdown we've had, I mean, the big cat sightings have actually peaked. And could this be because more people are going out, perhaps walking their dogs, you know, or there's less traffic on the roads that uh, they are sort of yeah. being more sort of favourable to sort of go out more? Yeah, so, no, that's does. possible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, a diff- it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because some of the photos that you see, and this is um, something we've spoken about before in regards to paranormal photographs, they're so far away, you can't judge it. No. That's always the point. I mean, the thing I always look for when I look at a, an alleged photograph of a big cat is the tail. The tail will usually sort of, to me, will give it away. I mean, you can tell a difference between a a domestic cat's tail and a big cat tail, I mean, because big cat tails are longer, sort of, tails of, like, like pumas, leopards, and stuff like that have quite distinct longer tails. And I have seen a couple, which, you know, <laughs> and they're usually black as well, and oh. uh, which, you know, would would suggest a puma of of some sort that's sort of out there somewhere. But uh, I thought a pumas were like 
like a silvery, taupey kind of colour, with tufty ears. Yes, possibly. Uh, what are the black lynx? ones? Uh, uh, no. Panther. Panther, yeah. The panthers are black, aren't they? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've, I think the lynx, I've, I think it's the lynx you're thinking about, the one with tufty ears, which are sort of the size, just, just a bit bigger than a big domestic cat. See, that is the thing. I mean, I saw a photograph the other day, and that was clearly a fox. It wasn't your traditional red fox that we would normally put on foxes, as it were. If you say fox, you think of the little red ones that you see running around. But foxes come in all kinds of different colours as well. Yeah, well, black is supposed to be quite a common colour, and uh, albino as well, isn't it? White. Yeah. I actually follow a group. It's not in the UK. It's an American group um, who um, is like a fox rescue Mm-hmm. I don't actually think it's in America. I think it might be Europe somewhere. Anyway, doesn't matter where it is. Um, and the the array of different colour foxes is crazy. Yeah, they're really cute. They giggle when they they're being their bellies are being stroked. Oh. It's really sweet. <laughs> um, anyway, <Foxes. laughs> back to animal mutilation, which is probably an area I thought the boys probably didn't think I'd go down. Now this has been a phenomenon since 1973. And it does generally happen in the Midwestern United States. The first of these actually occurred in Minnesota and Kansas. Now, the bits that they take from them are usually eyes, ears, mouth, rectum or the sex organs. Right. And the carcass is usually drained of blood. Now, the reason this is so weird is because obviously there don't seem to be any human interaction with the cattle. There's been no track marks or footprints around um, which you probably would get in those areas because they're quite dusty, aren't they? Yeah. Well, yeah, sort of like in the Dust Bowl out in the sort of desert regions, yeah, the northwest, yeah. Right, now, some of the carcasses were brought in for autopsies. They showed that the animals had actually died of ba- of blackleg, which is actually a cattle disease. Now, there is obviously the conspiracy theory that that's not actually what happened because if it was that particular thing, black leg then why were these pieces removed from the cattle Mm -hmm. okay so it then obviously coincided with alleged sightings of ufos and there was a massive jump of assumption that it must be ufos doing the cattle mutilations right and that's sort of why they sort of have linked the two fields Mm. Mm. yeah it seems that this hasn't been going on relatively that long, only what's it's what the early seventies, which is what fifty years. So, uh, you yeah, know, well, coming up to fifty years ago, I mean, it seems they take uh, or the parts that go sort of missing, or the parts they say that have been circular and surgically removed are like the soft tissue areas, aren't they? Yeah. So you'll say genitalia, sort of, you know, the backside and uh, around the sort of like lips and eyes are like the soft tissue areas, which would, which suggests that they would be the first thing to succumb to sort of uh, de- decomposition or other wild animals sort of feasting on them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you've yeah. certainly got that. I mean, well, Kenneth Ramel, um, who who he actually looked into this um, way back in the 1979s, he started this. Actually, said that he said he found no evidence of um, cattle mutilation apart from normal predator damage. Mm-hmm. He said it was consistent with that of small animals attacking the softest part of the cow. Oh, right, see, I was right. All right, next up. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we debunked that. <laughs> and again, another study was done by Daniel Kagan and Ian Summers in their book Mute Evidence. Again, it was the same thing. They indica- it indicated damage by small animals. <laughs> However... So we've got lack of evidence so far that there is anything unusual about this. Mm -hmm. Um, This continues to circulate. It continues to go around the the ufology world. It really is the strangest phenomenon I think I've ever come across um, on this one, how sometimes there are leaps of assumption. However, there have been accounts across the globe. There is one in Wales. 
oh. strange lights in the air. I, um, I think you know we we could file this this um, uh, case under Tom Jones, you know, because it's uh, not unusual. <laughs> 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 oh, right. Well, in Wales, um, this was in 1910, sheep were killed on a large scale by something that attacked half a dozen each night. Uh, rabbits were killed by having their backs broken. Um, lots of things that went on. And, you know, again, they were like, not sure what was right. causing this. And because that there was these UFO accounts of strange lights in the sky around the same time, it was put down to the ufology world. Now, they up in Wales kind of down, uh, put it down to a sheep predator. So they thought it might be a puma, like we've said, yeah. or wild dogs. And these apparently the wild dogs are well known to the farmers in many of the counties. And this was quite a while ago, didn't you say, the early Yeah, 1910. Yeah, so. Yeah, so possible. when we look at this, I mean, it would be great, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be great if we could find some form of evidence of UFOs? But I don't think cattle mut I don't think it lies in cattle mutilation. No, it's no. certainly sort of yeah, to the untrained eye, you know, sort of cat cattle mut and mutilations. I mean all these scientists seem to be convinced it's one you know, it is sort of predatory animals sort of coming and taking the soft tissue parts. Mm. And uh, for the layman to come across one, you know, it probably does look quite, you know, odd or disturbing for that matter. Yeah. I mean, Having uh, said that, many people have gone out and looked at things and, and have thought, God, that's not particularly consistent. And there are some well-known researchers out there that actually have thought, no, this isn't predator or small mammal um post-death kind of scenario and there is still this talk of conspiracy theory which we are all very familiar with these days isn't it yeah well, yeah true. there's conspiracy theory about everything isn't it well there is mm. just about everything and anything these days yeah people need to get out more well <laughs> obviously think... when it's safe to do so yeah, I think the problem with conspiracy theory, and we've sp talked about this before as well, is people are when people aren't in control, they try to find a reason, an understanding to get mm. back some form of control. Yeah, and we've just gone through a huge amount of time where we're not in control. <laughs> Anybody, you're not in control of being able to go to work. You're not in control of being able to leave the house. You're not able to go. You know what I mean? There's a lot yeah. of things that got took away from us in regard to control which is slowly being given back to us. Mm -hmm. But there is that sinister undertone, isn't there, of New World Order. This is them controlling us. Yeah, we can't I'm travel rubbish. without a vaccine passport. It forces you to make you have this vaccine. Lots of things are coming out about this. Now, it's changed. When we first had the when the first virus first hit, it was 5G masks are causing the virus. Remember yeah. that little cookie? Yeah, oh, yes. They used that to be all the way. down. Oh, I hanker for those days. It seems such a long time ago that 5G was on, the, was on the radar, wasn't it? Yeah. It feels a lifetime ago now, doesn't it? Yeah. But that's that was what they were all screaming about back in today. <laughs> so, so let's talk about this in regards to... Uh, we've gone from alien mutation, <laughs> cattle mutilation yeah. to conspiracy <laughs> theory... So um, let's talk about this a little bit. What's the most, what you're seeing now in the conspiracy theory world, what is the most bizarre one to your mind? I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying to normal, you know, to normal people. <laughs> uh, the most bizarre one is the face mask issue. And it's with the paper surgical ones. They've got a, a wire that goes along across the bridge of your nose so you can yeah so you can fold it so it sort of like you know folds into your face you can give it a little pinch and uh that and that wire is sort of uh picking up uh clandestine uh transmissions to control you Ooh. i know it's spooky stuff isn't it complete crap oh, see yeah. i i don't i mean since covid started it's just a case of common sense and that's what I've 
you know, employed. I, I don't buy into all this crap that comes out about it. Um, at the end of the day, what would I do if there was a pandemic? Mm-hmm. Exa- probably exactly what the government have done already. And there would there, there's nothing in it other than just to keep us safe. And if stupid people want to believe that there's great conspiracy theories out there and that, I mean, okay, I'm not saying there isn't a conspiracy theory about something else, but as far as COVID goes, I think it's just a case, especially in the UK, it's just a case of they want to keep everyone safe and this is the best way they can think to do it and they've done it. And all these people that think like, oh, by having the vaccine, it's going to, let me grow an extra arm or something. <laughs> all, all the other yeah. stupid people's comments out there, you know, <laughs> it, it's that they're, they're just their imaginations are run riot. Yeah, it's like um... because they've got nothing better to do, and they, you know, they're they're just stupid. Yeah, because it's about their safety, and if now now they want. Now they want everyone to have the vaccine. I really do believe that all these people that have believed all the crap that's out there, even the fake news, if they don't get the vaccine because of it, then they should be at least, you know, told that if you don't have this vaccine thing, then, you know, there's certain things you won't be able to do. Travelling away f- away from the country, for example, if you're not vaccinated, why run the risk of transmitting it from one country to another again? Stick them indoors. Mm. put a tag on them whatever <laughs> but i think even with that i think what you'll find is like this we're still in the throes of it this is yeah. i think that people get very insular don't they in regards to their own country and, and what's going on within their own country like mm. in the uk at this present time we're doing okay yeah we seem to have got it a bit under control yeah our nhs aren't overwhelmed you know we've got great vaccine rates going through the the population you know we have still restrictions certain restrictions in place but they're slowly slowly being um raised as we speak Mm -hmm. yeah this is how we've gone isn't it but other countries are literally on their knees at the moment because it is a global pandemic and so many things affect us in this country but we only see it from our perspective don't we in our country We don't look at the worldwide thing. Now, I personally, am, I've had the vaccine and I'm not comfortable with the idea of travelling at the moment. Mm-hmm. It's understandable, yeah. That That's my personal opinion. What, like, travelling, what, overseas? Abroad. Yeah. yeah, yeah, going on holiday abroad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm quite happy sticking to the UK at the moment. I'm not overly happy with the thought of that travel scenario. And I've had the vaccine. Yeah, it's not a vaccine. We're just like again, the word we've said this before. The wording is very misleading with vaccine. It is a, it's a jab that is teaching your body to deal with the virus. Yeah, it's not a be all and end all. You can't catch it thing. It's just teaching your body that if you do catch it, hopefully your symptoms won't be as extreme. Mm. So it downgrades it almost yeah. to a flu level serious yeah. but but not overwhelmingly serious kind of scenario yeah. then um then a vaccine where people seem to think it's a bit like the smallpox vaccine where you have the vaccine you can never catch it you can't catch it you can't transmit it this isn't yeah. they've called it a vaccine but it's not an actual it, it's different to what you would imagine a vaccine would be yeah. 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 It's not it's not an MMR or anything like that, is it? No, it's teaching your immune system to cope with the virus if it catches it. But it, it does it does offer you an extra protection of about ninety seven percent. So yeah. there's still a three percent chance you could still catch COVID. Exactly. And it doesn't mean you can't transmit it either. So if you did catch it, you could still transmit it, hence why you know, we still have measures in place for the time being until a certain level of the population, and I'm not just talking UK, I'm talking worldwide population, <clears throat> has yeah. been vaccinated, has had this jab. <laughs> Whichever yeah. one it is you have. Do you know what I mean? Because there are several mm-hmm. different ones out there now. So we need the world to be a certain percentage of vaccinated before the non-vaxxers 
can get a bit more freedom, right? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, until, well, as you said, the the other countries have followed suit. I mean, I know with Europe in particular, um, because of the politics that have been going on between the UK and Europe, they halted their vaccination programme. But if they'd carried on, they would have been at the same level we were, but they decided to stop. So they've put their public at risk because of politics. There was concerns, though, wasn't there, regarding the blood clot scenario? I don't want to get into the politics. I know politics did get mixed up. There was never any um, evidence that they they were linked. Just like a small percentage of people suffered blood clots after the vaccination. But on on the grand scheme of things, they could have not had the vaccin- vaccination and had the blood clots anyway. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so there we... is there is no scientific evidence that backs that claim up. And that's why we didn't halt the vaccination programme. And it was more to do with the politics between UK because we left the EU. Okay. Mm. Now, this all gets very, it is very political and you do have to look at things on a grander scale. The same rate, it's exactly the same as what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks in regard to the world wars. You have to look at the, the grand scheme. And we saw demonstrated historical reference as to how fake news can be put out there to affect a political agenda. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And that's what happened over the, the like, when the EU stopped. <laughs> It's a very strange thing, though, isn't it? When you when you start, it doesn't it doesn't it get murky when politics get involved? Of course, it does. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's because sort of... it's because people have faith in their in their governments, and when one government says, "Oh no, we can't use like the like the for example, I don't know, one of the EU countries turn and say, "Well, we can't buy the vaccine off of the EU because it's not working." And their government, uh, their people believe it, so they don't want to go or they stop it. We hear this in rumour, mm. and then our public are like, "Hang on a minute! If they've stopped it, why are we still getting it?" Mm. They don't understand that it's a a politics move as opposed to a political yeah, move. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because yeah. Uh, it's not until we tackle this globally will we get a true handle on it. I mean, it, it, it won't it won't be dealt it won't be dealt with like that it won't be like that globally each gov each government are going to handle it differently mm. of course they are depending at, on their yeah. demographic and so many other things come into that isn't it mm. and i think and, the eu the eu have finally um collapsed in in their thinking and thought well actually we need to kick start our vaccine program again well, they've got to kickstart the economy somehow. Yeah. And that is really, unfortunately, the only way out we've got of this at the moment. Well, yeah. as, I said, as you said, we're, we're dealing with this quite well and we're nearly at the point where everything is open again. But not other countries are. And this is why you no. have to look at it on the grand scale, the bigger picture, mm-hmm. rather than the, the insular view of your own personal circumstance well that's it we, we can only do so much and then once we're there we all we'd be doing is sitting aside watching all these other countries struggling unfortunately there are countries struggling out there and we send our goodwill and god bless to anybody in a country that is actually going through a massive wave at this moment in time special thoughts go out to india and Brazil as well at this moment in time because they are struggling with getting a handle on this. But this is what we have to look at. So do we feel, right, conspiracy theory, we're talking in general. Um, yours was the mask one, um, mm. Richard. That seems to be the most crazy one that you've come across. Mm-hmm. Paul, what's the most crazy conspiracy theory that you've come across? I, I in, in respect of COVID, nothing. I, I don't know. Because Not I don't, it. No, I don't follow it whatsoever. It's just a case of, I mean, I've seen enough about pandemics before through documentaries and movies and things like that. I I know that I need to keep away from everyone, so that's exactly what I do. That is true. He has everybody. We haven't seen him for a year. Yeah, for a year. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, I've hugged myself away for nearly a year. Um, Over a year now. Well, yeah, it is, yeah, over a year. Um, 
But no, I mean, I've been training for the zombie apocalypse ever since, um, like the one, uh, the Walking Dead started. <laughs> <laughs> now, so I just treated an, it like that. This is an interesting point because when we looked into what would happen in a zombie apocalypse, which we have done a show on everybody, so if you want to yeah. go and check that out, it's over on our YouTube channel, which is Paranormal Concept. And for more of um, our fantastic shows, <laughs> pre-PA UK, then go over to Paranormal uh, Parasearch Archive. Archive Parasearch? It's Archive Parasearch or Parasearch. We've got two YouTube channels. Which oh, I changed the... that one to the Paranormal Concept. Oh, have you? Oh, okay, yep. Yeah, so it's Paranormal Concept or Archive Parasearch. You can oh. find all of our past shows on there. And we did a show on how to survive a zombie apocalypse. Now, whilst we were looking into that show, we actually did come across <laughs> the CDC, right, have actually done a model, you know, like where they do a model of what would happen if yeah. this did actually happen. Um, and the best place is to go, the, your biggest chance of survival. And there is actually a council in the UK, it's Bristol Council, that actually has a worksheet on how to survive a zombie apocalypse. How amazing is that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they can't be serious, surely. No, seriously. Yeah, no, it seriously. was, yeah. yeah it was, right. Seriously, it was so funny. But Ob it, obviously, the CDC does... focused on America. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if it ever does happen, I mean, me and Kerry done the research on that show, so we'll, we'll be all over that. Um, and, you know, we, we both watched The Walking Dead, so we yeah. know how to get them and everything, you know, we, we can fight back. We're all over that. But oh, we did say you. on that show, we want the Walking Dead kind of zombies, not the... Um, oh, yeah. Well, 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 yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. a run pretty fast, can't they? Yeah, they're, they're zombies. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, you want you want the Walking Dead ones. Mm -hmm. Or, or um, Resident Evil. Yeah, the slow, ambling, groaning, continually kind of zombies. Yeah. Because first of all, you can see, you can hear them coming. And secondly, they're quite slow, so you stand a better chance, right? Yeah, we, yeah, exactly. We obviously want the um, first stage of zombie. We don't like, we don't want the um, the Genesis program ones. Uh -oh. they're, they're just right. Weird. So how do you actually kill one of these zombies then? Do you have to cut their heads off? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. you have to like um damage the brain don't you you have to yeah or remove the head yeah because even just removing the head it'll still be chomping away on the floor yeah oh, but it'd be more funny well <laughs> yeah it, it'd just be a, it'd just be like a really posh nutcracker oh god oh, what? god. oh, yeah, oh my lord oh my lord <laughs> Get anyway. the old walnut in its mouth. Yeah, Christmas <laughs> like, yeah, come early. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on from that thought. <laughs> oh, my God. So, conspiracy theories are nothing new, as we've, you know, we've talked about more recent ones. But there's some really famous conspiracy theories that have hit over our time of life. Walking on the moon, did we or didn't we? Of course we did. Of course we did. <laughs> I, but I know there's a there there is a huge thriving community out there that have a lot of vested in, and interest to say we didn't. Uh, I must admit, you know, you sort of look at some of their arguments, and some of them do seem uh, quite plausible. But my official standpoint is we did walk on the moon. Uh, that's about it, really. I, st I still think though the funniest ever. Um, conspiracy theory and it even makes me laugh now right is is people all over the globe think the world is flat mm -hmm. yeah flat yeah world. i have yeah. trouble with that one as well yeah that, that's hilarious i got into a cab and um the guy was talking about that and i was uh, with my son and he was talking to the cab driver and it came up that he was interested in the weird and wonderful and he started talking about flat earth theory and I'm like and my son goes my mum knows all about that and I'm thinking shut up shut up because I'm <laughs> going to get into a row with this bloody cab driver in a minute and um yeah so I, I was just I just was like yeah right, bloody kids <laughs> yeah <laughs> get, get me in trouble with the cab driver I was like really seriously you seriously believe that I don't think so yeah I, I just thought it was amusing because there was like some publication that um, it was it was flat Earth um, 
you know, concentrated on the flat earth theory and everything. And it must be like a monthly publication they, they have. And um, it said people all over the globe believed flat earth. Just the, yeah, that, just just that, that word statement. Yeah. There are reasons why they believe this, though. And, and, you know, I could kind of, again, for the unscientific person, I could sort of see why those arguments would hold weight. But to the side, if you only, you've only got to look into it a little bit more deeply to realise that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a very, 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 very outdated idea. It, it's a nice idea, but they're wrong. Yeah. Anyway, going back to the moon landing, mm-hmm. there was. Um, I think that is a problem because. I think the government at the time, or the NASA, whoever, the the body, the pe- the people, whoever they were, I think there was a crossover. I think it went ahead, but I also think they had a backup plan. And I think the two have merged over the years, which is why we have this now conspiracy theory that we didn't actually do it. Because I, That's how I think it played out. I think they did achieve it. But I think because they had this backup plan and they sort of like merged the two together just right. in case, because if worst case scenario had happened, they wouldn't want that news out because obviously at the time they were in the space race with Russia and all that. And it was all about a power control thing going on between the, the big two big countries mm-hmm. at the time. I think the backup plan is what's confused the issue Things have got leaked about the backup plan, even though they did achieve it. So it's undermined the achievement. That's yeah. what I think happened with that. Sounds plausible. The See, photographs, that... the you know, the photographs that are supposed to have been taken in the desert, the film footage that was supposed to have been done by what was it, Stanley Kubrick? Oh right, yeah, Stanley Kubrick, yeah. Yeah, that was supposed to have been done, um, and I think they were backup plans. So even if the worst case scenario had happened on that um, flight, you know, that achievement, they would have cut into the backup plan they had so the public would never know something horrible had happened. So America still would have achieved their objective, even if they hadn't. Luckily enough, it all went swimmingly. They got back to Earth. We've got physical proof of men back on Earth that said they went to the moon. So I'm quite surprised that no one's actually come up with a conspiracy theory in regards to this um, space force that Donald Trump wanted to implement. I don't, I don't know if they've done anything towards it yet, but he, he wanted something to, um, like like an air force, but in space. Mm-hmm. That, that's what he wanted. So my um, thoughts on that, would be surely it would be better if it was a global force as opposed to just the Americans. There is a conspiracy theory about that. Okay. Which is basically he wanted to put that in force because of the threat of aliens. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, it it could go either way. I mean, to protect us from aliens, should they exist, or an exploration standpoint, because it'd be easier to shoot rockets off into space from space than it is from down here. A lot cheaper as well, because you wouldn't need the rocket fuel. Mm. So, I mean, unless he's doing it under the powers of the UN, why just him? Why, Why does he just want to do it? Why don't he sit the world down and go, right, this is my plan. World contribution there. The problem <laughs> is he said he, he himself, bless him. Um, and I'm going to get into the politics of this because I don't know the politics of this. And um, quite frankly, and it's so diversive um, between people. That whole situation was horrible to watch, by the way. Um he, some people see him as very forward thinking or completely bonkers. Yeah. He's he's very divisive, isn't he? You either love him or you hate him. There doesn't seem to be any middle ground with to, him. To be fair, I think it's a really good idea. 
But we can't even not... police the people on the planet, let alone people off the planet. No, I know. But it, as I said, it'll give a good basis for space exploration and go into different planets and things like that. And, you know, just think of all the experiments they can do in zero, zero gravity. But they're doing those anyway on the space station. Yeah, but just think they could do so much more. You know what I love about that, though? I love the fact that you can see them now more. Mm. They do a lot more live streams and, you know, yeah, from the space from, station. Especially oh, for yeah. schools and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. You can watch the NASA channel, which you can get online. I think you can get it on YouTube, which they show launches, have have programs on. And it is quite interesting stuff. And as for the space station, there's a 24-hour feed from the from the space station and, the, and as it circles the Earth and it plays mm. lovely classical music. It's it's quite it's quite relaxing to watch. Mm. So I know I I do I do think it's a really good idea, but it needs to be a global effort, not just one country. Yeah, I don't object to space exploration. mm. I don't object to that. I think there's a lot of stuff that we don't understand about how our universe works and stuff which impacts the Earth. You know Mm. what I mean? I think there's a lot of things that we don't understand. Um, in regards to that so yeah I, I like the idea of space exploration but you've always got the human factor in there and that is always a worry well that, that's it I mean we we can't do nothing about that at the end of the day True. but it will have to be a mixture of not just the sciences but it'll have to be military as well well yeah because the military is is in a position to get the resources to actually do that. Mm. Uh, except I mean, if, if the military, they, example, yeah, but except um, the military's focus is always on secure, you know, protection. Yeah, it, protection. That, that's, and... and that's where it becomes a bit murky because they they will utilise that as a way of, another way of, of safety and security for their own particular country. You're never going to get a global force in place well, that, where they all said... agree. That's I mean, this is the problem, isn't we've it? Got, we've got a global force in in sort of power almost, um, and that's the United Nations. <laughs> Was that a little snigger there, Gary? <laughs> oh, did I? Sorry, did I do that out loud? <laughs> Anything we need to tackle globally, it's, it's run through the United Nations, for which everyone's a part of. Mm. Yeah. Which they spend more time arguing about stuff and can never <laughs> yeah. agree. Well, the, yeah, yeah. They just have to the smash United their heads Nations together. is a good idea in uh, concept, but uh, it's never really sort of well. It's only no. And don't get me wrong; uh, it has made great achievements, but you know they they seem to go the hard way about doing things. Anyway, let's pull this back to the paranormal because we've got well off track of the paranormal. Yeah. Uh, it's because we went down the UFO route and conspiracies and zombie apocalypses and how the yeah. hell did we get uh, get into the United Nations and how effective they are? Who knows, right? <laughs> I did travel. say this is a free-flowing <laughs> kind of show tonight. Who knows what direction it will take? So let's get back to the paranormal. Let's get back down to the nitty-gritty. Right. Now, we've talked about our paranormal journey before on a show, and, and you know, you all know sort of where we've come from and what we've done. There's an awful lot of judgment out there in the paranormal field at the moment, isn't there? We've oh, talked in about... The in the UK, we've got a heck of a lot going on in the, in the paranormal field, and everybody mm-hmm. seems to be worried about what everybody else is doing and not actually concentrating on their own personal journey in regards to the paranormal. I love a good ghost hunt, guys. Well, yeah, if we all do, I think. Uh, you know, sort of, uh, hopefully we can, we will all be meeting up uh, soon, won't we, when yeah. we go to yeah. RAF Nettershead for investigating yeah. in a COVID permitting. So, yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah. Looking forward to that too. I'm very much looking forward to that. God, it's been every year now, hasn't it, pretty much? Yeah. So, There's a thing on the table at the moment. What do we think about graveyards? Should we investigate graveyards? Uh, Personally, I've never investigated a graveyard. I've sort of uh, 
sort of uh, gone around old deserted churches, which, well, obviously have graveyards attached to them. And uh, to be quite honest, I can't see a problem with it. Unless, oh. it, unless it's privately owned and uh, whatever, but uh, unless, you know, it's a council one and they've got lock gates and stuff. But usually uh, graveyards and churches are, are, are free access anyway. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I, I do like to walk around the graveyards mm-hmm. um, and I, I'm quite interested in like the old Gothic style graveyards. Yeah. I just think they're, they're amazing and the atmosphere and everything's really good. Um, but as for investigating one, no, I, I don't believe that we should be investigating them. People are laid to rest. Leave them to rest. What makes you think they would haunt her graveyard in the first place? Well, exactly. Your body's left to rot there, basically. But if if they want to be left alone and laid to rest, as as it states... You know, they're they're just laying there at rest. You know, you you should leave them alone. Respect that. Respect them for that. Mm -hmm. Leave them alone. You know, they they don't want to be bothered. If if they're okay and they want to come and communicate, then go somewhere where they were most happiest or like their house or, you know, somewhere where they used to frequent, maybe a pub or something. Go and haunt them places and then there'll be paranormal investigators flood into those locations instead of graveyards it's usually i have investigated graveyards i've got to hold my hands up in my not early stages no i don't think there's anything wrong with <laughs> it i'm not investigating new graves i would point that out i think there's that's no that's distasteful you shouldn't do that but when you're in the dark you can't see a new grave from an old one you can't you can, tell no you can tell you can I I still wouldn't do it. Leave them alone. Let them rest. No, that's your that's your opinion. My personal opinion mm. on this one is I don't see it's any harm as long as you don't tread on graves. I make a you know I don't like that. I won't tread on a no, grave. I don't. Respectful. I don't. You do it respectfully. You don't go yeah. for new graves. That's that's distasteful in my opinion. But old graveyards. There's some amazing old graveyards around, um, and I have. I hold my hands up. I have, in my early stages of investigating, done investigations at a graveyard. Yeah, I know I have. See, playing play devil's advocate a little bit here. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Why would you not investigate or communicate with a spirit that's just been buried at a graveyard? Because of the um, relatives, out of respect for the living right? relatives. So what, what would happen then if, I don't know, Uncle Joe Bloggs or whatever died a week ago, and then a week later you went to a medium and they gave you a message. I'm what would blocks. happen. That's the well, spirit's that's the same choice. Thing, isn't it? No, spirit's choice. Yeah, but the spirit would have a choice when you were in the graveyard as well. You no, uh, no, there's a, dis- there's, a mor- there's a distinct difference between you going out searching for it or mm. going to a medium just for your relatives to come through. Okay. If your Uncle Bob passed a week ago and comes through that medium to you, that's your Uncle Bob, yeah, yeah for example, that's personal to you, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas if you go to a graveyard, you're not going to a graveyard to your own family's graves. You're going to somebody else's. You're going to a different family. Okay. See Do you see you what mean. I'm saying? Yeah, okay. So there's a distinct yeah. difference between the two. I have investigated graveyards that are quite old, disused now people don't they're overcrowded so they don't get buried uh the burials don't happen there anymore um i have one on canvey that's now there's a, apparently there's a different graveyard on canvey a burial um site on canvey i didn't know that until today i was like oh didn't know this was here oh, yeah, they just the up um because the old i wouldn't go actually to that graveyard either because it's so public the ones i've been to have been out of the way, very old graves to the point where you can't even read the headstones kind of thing. You can tell the ground has subsided and moved, so the graves are all higgledy-piggledy. You know, the gravestones are all higgledy-piggledy. So they're really old graves, and we stuck away from the more recent areas out of respect 
for people. The old higgledy-piggledy kind of graves, nobody tends to visit anymore. Mm. Whereas the newer ones, or in living memory, you can tell they're loved, they're generally loved and cared for. You can see people still put flowers on them and stuff like that. That, in my personal opinion, you don't do. that. You keep away, out of respect for the living. But the old higgledy piggledy ones, there's stories to be told there. And if if you was to get something, yeah, which to be fair, looking back, we didn't. Mm. You know what I mean? But it kind of we cut out that's how we cut our teeth. And I'm going back like five or six years. It didn't have the taboo that it has now that it did have. That it do you know what I mean? At the time when we were doing it, it didn't have a taboo in the same way it has now. I, I think, you know, back then, though, it was down to your own personal opinion and your common sense. And that's something that the social media paranormal community have lost a little bit, their common sense. Mm. Yeah, because we weren't now, live streaming or doing anything like no, that. We were no. just they're, going out. But they're sticking their nose into other people's business where it ain't wanted and they're passing their opinion and judgment on them. Well, yeah. And, and uh, that's that's dividing the social media um, paranormal community. Oh. They're, they're, they're killing themselves because, you know, there's, there's a few locations that because of these certain people sticking their nose in where it ain't wanted, um, they've decided to close up shop. They're not going to let paranormal investigators in. They're, they're just cutting their nose off to spite their face. Mm. They need to mind their own business and get on with what they're supposed to be doing and what they enjoy doing. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Crap that's right. Yeah. Doing. I mean, that's well, that's what you'll teach a school child, wouldn't it? And if you keep yep. coming back and saying, oh, they're all doing this, well, don't worry what they're doing. You, yeah. You just treat them like children. Do you not think, though, because of this lockdown or, you know, because of this situation and we have been more online, we haven't been going out and getting on and doing our own thing, that there's been a certain amount of judgment on people who makes a business from doing live streams on social media. If you think you can't earn a living, there are certain people out there that are. Oh, and it's just it. jealousy because it's... they're doing it. They're doing it as an like an employment opportunity, and they are earning money out of it, whatever way you look at it. So you know, as long as it's paying their bills, it's fine because it's work. And those people that are doing it as a hobby, they're jealous. And to be fair, they're doing it as a hobby, so they're not even proper paranormal investigators anyway. Mm. They're just ghost hunters that want the cheap thrill for the night, and then that's the end of their investigation. So have the live streams on the socials in regard to this, have they overtaken um, the TV shows, do we think? Have they replaced the TV shows? Because that's what you're seeing, effectively, is an uncut, unedited TV show being played out on the Mm. social media feed rather than edited and cut on a television show. They're, they're, do you see what I mean? There's, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not certain... doing anything different to what we've seen on TV shows. They're just doing it live, whereas TV shows yeah. are, are more um, slick, aren't they? They're more edited. I mean, yeah. It... I, I think they sort of run side by side. I, I don't think one's overtaking the other. If it and if you can get the formula right and you do attract the audience, I mean, uh, particularly on the YouTube... Uh... <laughs> And their audiences actually do outstrip, outstrip uh, uh, television audiences. And uh, mm. there are some people out there that have been offered TV contracts that turn them down because they are on YouTube and they can make more money doing it on YouTube and get more recognition than what they do yeah. than, than, than what they ever could doing a TV show. I mean, doesn't doesn't most haunted now go yeah. on YouTube? Yeah. yeah, they do. That's all YouTube now. Yeah. yeah. So and they've they, got a massive following. Yeah, they had a massive following. They they were on TV, obviously in living TV at one point. Then um, the two people that owned Most Haunted, Carl and Yvette, mm-hmm. they didn't they didn't they buy their own TV channel, Paranormal TV, mm-hmm. and that was on Sky at one point, and that was their own Paranormal channel. Mm. You know, and now they've pulled all that back just to slap it on YouTube. 
There was a lot of derogatory comments from the paranormal community against Most Haunted, and now they've switched onto the the ghost hunting live streams that are seen. I don't think you should air your dirty linen in public. I will say that. There are some teams that have rows on their live streams and, oh, God, yeah. all sorts has gone on. It makes it almost like EastEnders kind of scenario on, on the paranormal. I don't like those. Just get on and do the job that you're out there to do, yeah. quite frankly. You know, we don't need the haters. And um, But I, I quite enjoy watching some of them. I, I can't – yeah, all right. So they still say an orb is a spirit activity and every knock and every bang and every flick of a twig is a is a ghost. You know what I mean? I, but that's fun. It's entertainment. See, I, I don't watch any shows whatsoever on TV or YouTube or live or anything. I don't don't watch them. I do occasionally no, if I'm not doing a lot else. I'm not going to lie. For me, for me I'm, a, I'm a paranormal investigator, so I will investigate a location more than once, investigate it, investigate it, investigate oh. it, and uh, uh, on a long-term basis. And all these people that keep going to locations for one night and going, oh, yeah, that's haunted. What rubbish. They can't do that. You can't say that over one night. No, but you could do both. You can oh, be you, the paranormal oh, yeah, no, investigator. You can. you can do that and have that side of it. I mean, bearing in mind, I know a heck of a lot myself. I'm very sceptical minded about a lot of oh, things. Yeah, no, you can't. Yeah, but you can't. I love to watch a ghost hunt where they do think the orb is a spirit. And I do, <laughs> I laugh. I think it's amusing, but it's, it's entertainment. And a lot of people are enjoying that experience that they're watching played out. I yeah, can't no, see I, the problem. I'm not saying there is a problem with it. No, no. Mm. In, you know, in regards to what people's expectations are, if you're if you tune in expecting to see a proper paranormal investigation, then well, you're going to be very bored for a very long period of time. Fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, not only that, I mean, we, we've because I because a lot of ghost hunters out there that do this one night session and then it's all done and dusted. Um, because a lot of them people call themselves ghost, uh, paranormal investigators, real genuine people that have haunt, uh, alleged hauntings in their houses will look up a paranormal investigation team and nine times out of ten they're going to hit one of these ghost hunting teams and do the one night session in their house. But occasionally you'll get someone genuine and, you know, that they once you start asking questions like an investigator should, um, they sort of go away because they expect what's on the telly. Yeah, I would agree with that, yeah. The amount of yeah. times I've had people come to me and say, I've got this, I think I might have a ghost in my house, can you come round and have a look? Well, okay, fill in this form for me just so I can get a better idea of what's going on and um, keep a diary of all the stuff going on. From my point of view, it's to obviously see if there's a pattern, see what the best time is to go around there and things like that. But because they can't be bothered and they want someone like Carl and Yvette <laughs> of Most Haunted to come around to the living room and do a live edition of Most Haunted there and then, they don't want the questions. So they just prompt, you know, they go to one of these ghost hunting teams. I think and if it was... Nothing I... gets solved. No, I think if it was if somebody really was having a problem and really believed it was that they would do the diary, they would make they would document it. Yeah, I've only ever read that once or twice. So, but then how many times have we said like when we was talking to Darren Ritson with in regards to the South Shields poltergeist, mm. it fell in his lap. He wasn't expecting it. Thought yeah. it was not going to be March. Walked in. It was full blown. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It was like, they're rare. The Enfield haunting, rare. Do you know what I mean? Even going down to um, 30 East Drive, when that, the original case, not now, but the original yeah. case, it's rare. Oh, yeah. It doesn't happen on every street corner. So if you do get somebody approach you who thinks they're having a an anomalous experience we'll say then yeah you have to deal with it in the right way there's no two questions about that but if they want the most haunted experience then they'll soon disappear mm. 
But if they were truly experiencing something, they would do the diary because it would be disconcerting. I, th- I think my, my concern over that is that you'll get one of these teams in there that's like the whole most haunted live show in the living room. And then they turn around after the first night and go, yeah, it's haunted. I know. Let's hire it out to paranormal investigators and get them in there. Just like places like De Grey Street and 30 East Drive. And there is another one as well, isn't there? Demon House or something. But those places are not lived in by a family. The damage gets caused when a family has genuine activity. A paranormal team goes in, does the most haunted experience, and then becomes a, you know, they don't solve anything. Mm. No, exactly. They don't know how to solve that or help the family. That's where damage gets done. 30 East Drive has got its own attached paranormal team called East Drive Paranormal. Right, all they're worried about is getting paranormal teams in there. But no not... family lives there. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if there's a family that lives there or not. Yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. All the all that team's worried about is getting money into that property for the owner. On that note, we have got to take a quick break. We'll be back right after this to continue this very heated discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? Welcome back to the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And it's all getting very heated in the studio tonight. <laughs> well, I think Paul's getting a bit hot under the collar. Are you getting hot under the collar, Paul? No, I'm just saying the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't see any... I'm going back to the argument straight away, going straight in with my baseball, baseball bat... <laughs> Don't see any difference between something like Thirty East Drive and Nettie's Head. It's a paranormal no, no, location there, you can hire. No, that, that's right, you can. But my my point is that um, there was a paranormal case happened in Thirty East Drive. Okay, it was right back in the sixties. But then a ghost hunting team went in, not a paranormal investigator. The paranormal investigations that go on there are not researched properly. But that's two different time spans. You're looking at two completely different. Mm. You, you know what happened when it was first going on. You got to remember that was back in the late sixties. Mm. Do you know what I mean? They didn't. It wasn't the field wasn't like it is today. No. And didn't witness anything when he went in. So yeah. it's just like, oh, it's fine. They called priests in. Mm. Didn't seem to do a lot. But their family, when you read the initial, the Alpha Saucy account, which is in Colin Wilson's book, Poltergeist, a definitive um, guide to, I believe it's called, yeah. um, is not, they don't see, the family themselves don't seem that overly worried. When they're talking about it, they're talking about it post-event, quite a long time post-event, and it's very reminiscent, it's very, like, anecdotal. Yeah. Mm. So at the time... They weren't, yeah, they called people, you know, like the priest did and that, but it didn't, they didn't reach out. Now, bearing in mind, at the same sort of time in the press, you've got the Enfield haunting and the SPR <coughs> was very prevalent in that. Yeah. Mm. Was very, was there is a more. precedence for the family if they needed extra help, as it were, because they knew the SPR were around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or could have easily found out that the SPR around um and didn't reach out and then you have to ask the question why because they found ghost hunters instead they found one it wasn't a team it was one person the people mm. that investigated it were pontifract if i oh gosh um can't remember the team now but they're not together anymore and um, that was years later years later mm. and that was before it really hit 
the paranormal circuit just whilst the film was being made and that. And by then, the family weren't now. The family had moved out and moved on. Mm. So there's a there's a very big distinct gap between the activity that happened and then it hitting the paranormal circuit. Yeah. And even to the point where the family had activity and it was then discussed in regard to paranormal circles like being put out there for um, Colin Wilson even and people like that. Yeah. So there, there is there is a d- distinct gap between family being affected and then the paranormal team taking it and running. And a lot of that was driven from the film mm, that was made. Yeah. Yeah, when the lights go out. Yeah, it was bought by, um, oh, I can't remember, the, I never remember the bloke's name now, but one of the uh, friends, it one of the the mum's son, friend's mum's son is is who it is. Do mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Patrick, yeah. somebody or other. And then Bill as well bought the property off the back of when the lights go out and then did a whole launch night where they did a competition, spend the night, watch the uh, the launch of the film in the property, and then that's sort of where it went from there. Mm. And then it was officially launched as a paranormal location, no different from us hiring Nettie's Head and going to Nettie's Head. What worries me is if a family is having genuine activity and a ghost hunting team goes in and causes more problem than actual trying to help the family. Mm. They go in there to try and... Um, you know, when you do that, you should observe, not try and interact. You're observing the phenomena. Well, yeah. There's a difference. I, I think that is, you've hit the nail on the head there, Kerry. You know, you're not going in there to sort of run around uh, with uh, all the tech and everything. K2 which, metres. Yeah, because uh, because who who's ever called you in is not doing that, but they but they are still experiencing something. So mm. you need to experience it, if possible, how they are experiencing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, it's a very different ball game. A private case is a very different ball game from a from what we're seeing out there in the field. And, you know, even public investigations, they're entertainment. You go along for an experience. Yeah. If you do capture something, wow, amazing, because it very rare, it very rarely happens, right? I've caught something. We've all caught something, but we've been doing it a lot of years and spent yeah, a lot of hours doing to, it. To be fair, the only things I've actually caught are probably, I, I could count on one hand, uh, the many times that I've been investigating. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had countless personal experiences, but the actual ones I've actually caught on camera and have physical evidence of, I can I can literally count on one hand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I could actually, I've got the link because I posted it on YouTube, actually, my evidence. And um, it's been used in a few videos, mm-hmm. especially the one produced by Andy Mercer. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, it, um, I can post that clip into the chat, uh, into the group later. Yeah, yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. People, I'm sure people will be interested to, to see that. Yeah. Very much so. It's a very difficult world, isn't it, out there? There are so many um, levels and nuances in the paranormal field and different levels of experience and knowledge, you know. And do you want to learn or do you want to just experience? Again, that's a very different world. You know, there's so many theories and thoughts out there from different people, books written by different people on different topics on the same subject, but all from a different perspective, mm-hmm. different levels of research that have been done. Yeah. It's it is a very a multi-nuanced field with multiple layers of differences. And I think when people try to bundle it under the same banner or mm. think they're better than another person because they're doing it differently, I think it's a very dangerous world. I think that's dangerous territory that you mm. enter into because you're – Judging it from your own personal perspective, not for what it is. Yeah. You know, mm. what is it? How much impact does it have? Are those live streams or whatever forwarding the field? No. But are they supposed to? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> if you want to go for places where you think, you know, the research is being done and they're forwarding the field, then to be fair, you're not going to find it much on the socials. No. You'll find links to talks. You'll find links to events that do give you a broader understanding of the field. Like there's been a lot of webinars recently, isn't there, ever since lockdown, yeah. like ASAP and SPR, things like that have been taking their um, – they used to do talks like on a, you know, through an evening um, rather than, and you would go and see mm. it and listen to the person and then you'd be able to ask questions and whatnot. They're doing it as a webinar now because obviously we haven't been able to get together in a room. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, like study days and stuff like that being done all online now, which is fantastic because it means people like little old me <laughs> can still attend these Without having to think, God, I've got to get, get into London or wherever it be for nine or seven p.m., which is the start time through rush hour commute. Yuck! Is all I can say to that. No one likes to travel through rush hour in London. Uh, you know, it, it makes it more accessible to people, doesn't it? Well, so I think yeah. it's a good thing. I think the lockdown for the groups like that, the the you know those bodies, even though I still have certain criticisms of those, I do think has broadened the field a little bit, made it more accessible to people. So if you was looking for something to broaden your horizons and experience and knowledge, then it's now more readily accessible mm. Yeah, than it was like... before. It just depends on what you want out of the field, mm. which is why all these attempts at previous governing bodies over the entire field would have never worked because there's too many different variations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's 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 often talked about, isn't it, trying to sort of like but uh, the other attempts to do it have failed and any future attempts uh, to do it. Well, have, the, the only again, failed. the only reason it's failed is because um the the people who wanted to set that sort of thing up were then accused of corruption themselves in one way or another. Mm-hmm. And it's all like the armchair warriors. They all get involved and, and you know, they they step into those positions and those roles. So then, you know, it, it's just a vicious circle. So it's not something that's ever going to be achieved. But you're no. not going to – I think when people think governing body, there are – every aspect of a public investigation is covered by some legal law or other. Well, whether yeah. it be food hygiene, whether it be, um, you know, you're protected in regards to payments, you know, all those sort of things are all set up. Insurances for health and safety aspects, you know, you should be doing various things. There are so many different laws that cover general business that yeah. co that will cover you if you're doing a public investigation and you should adhere to those laws, well, yeah. Yeah. those legalities. Yeah, and then you're covered. In regards to what you offer, i.e. paranormal experience, you can't guarantee you're going to get paranormal phenomena happening. No, no. You and can't. You still, with, with the events, you still have to have them labelled as, um, as for entertainment purposes only. The same as you do if you go to a medium. Yep. Mm -hmm. For pretty much the same reasons. Exactly. So they're all covered. Well, so, I think you. I think you're fine. There ain't many, com like groups out there, that have websites and do public events that do actually state that. Hardly any of them have got um, private privacy statements that they should have under the GDPR laws. You know, there, there's loads of you know, the terms and conditions. You know, they they're not all up to scratch. Some of them only, haven't even got terminal conditions, so when you buy your tickets, if they run off of your money, sorry, it's your own fault. Better luck next time. So it's all things that like that that some of these groups need, and they, they're not doing them. Maybe they're the ones that need to be targeted <laughs> with the event laws. But you still have recourse in regard to um, you can go through in the same way as I always look at it is um, how would it work if it was a builder? Yeah, 
you get a quote, the builder comes along, finishes half the job and doesn't do the job or doesn't turn up at all and you've paid a deposit. So you have recourse there. You can go through legal channels to get your money back. Mm. In the same way as if you booked an event with a company and it didn't go ahead or whatever for whatever reason, you have the same channels mm. that you can go through to get your money yeah. back. Oh, that's it. But then, you know, if, if you go to a whatever company it is and have a look on their website at their events they're selling, always check their terms and conditions. If they mm-hmm. haven't got terms and conditions, avoid them like the plague. Yeah, I agree with that statement. Yeah. You know, and they should have a um, a, a, a privacy statement telling you exactly what's going to happen to your details because every time you buy a ticket, your whether it's your credit card number gets stored with them or your personal details like name, address and phone number gets stored with them. Yeah. They need a privacy statement to tell you exactly what's going to be happening with those details. Yeah. You know, the same way if you signed up for um, a store card, for example, exactly the same thing. Yeah, exactly. You, they have to tell you what's happening. You know, your privacy, the GDPR, as Paul says, is very, very strict. Um, yeah. I run a crystal business and I have to put out a GDPR statement. It's in my um, what my company's about statement, what happens to your details. They only ever share with PayPal so I can get invoiced. And through that, you have payment protection. Yeah, do you know exactly. what I mean? Unless you do it by friends and family, which I never ask for. You know, there are certain things that are in play already. So is it then that people are trying to govern the ethical side of the paranormal? <clears throat> I, I think, it again, it's down to common sense, not ethics. Because, you know, you, you go into a... a building and if it's almost like crumbling away and you've paid to go on that event if anything happens to you again you know it's it's down to insurance as well so you you really need to check out the the um companies that you're going with Mm -hmm. if they haven't got any terms and conditions then more than likely they haven't got your gdpr best interests at heart Mm -hmm. you know so there's that danger you could end up losing your money if they were that dodgy. Um, so it begs to, to question whether they have actually got insurance as well. And they should have. It is a legal requirement that they carry their insurance with them mm-hmm. and have it on display. But, I mean, because we, we, with my company in particular, when we done events, we always had the certificate with us but yeah. because we were travelling from one site to another, um, if anyone wanted to see the insurance certificate, all they had to do was ask. Mm. Mm-hmm. And we would happily show them. You know, and that is a legal requirement that they have to have it on site when they're there. So is there a responsibility? I mean, coming away from the legality side of it, is there a responsibility for the spiritual well being of guests that come on to a paranormal investigation because as we know there is a whole you know the brain's a weird thing and you can I've picked up an attachment or something like is there a spiritual responsibility to that yeah there is I I believe there is yeah but then that I think that might be moral definitely a moral code of conduct so do we think that that is what the problem is we need an ethical and moral code of conduct. Possibly. But then it it just comes down to common sense. And again, when you're selling the event, you need to know exactly what you're buying. If if you're, you're getting on, getting a ticket for somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But then we've seen how we've seen how common sense can vary so much per person. Oh yeah. You know, what's common sense to one person Maybe an infliction on my human rights to another. Mm. Going back to where we started this conversation in regard to conspiracy theory. Yeah. It, it's so, it very, again, common sense varies incredibly between people, doesn't it? What it, it I say, does, what makes sense definitely. to me doesn't necessarily make sense to another person. 
But when it when it comes to buying and selling something, especially a ticket, you get what you pay for. So you should be able to find out as much information as you can from that advert. If you've still got questions, there's always an email attached to a website or a contact us form. Ask your questions. Yeah, you know... Yeah, bo- don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid, you know, buyer beware, you know. Cause... I mean, yeah. the, the, most, the most questions I got asked, or the commonly asked questions, was about disabled people. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they said to me, oh, I want to go to this location, but I'm in a wheelchair. Can I, is it suitable for me? And obviously it depends on what location it is. If it's something like Kelvin and Hatch, I'd be like, well, no, sorry, it's not suitable for you because there is stairs to the lower levels. Mm. You can get into the top level, but that that's it. You know, you, you can't go, you wouldn't be able to go down the stairs. It's not just um, about that, though. It's about thinking about toilet facilities and things like that exactly. as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, I didn't really think of that until those sort of questions come into it. Mm. Um, but, you know, I've, I've always now stated on the bottom of some of my descriptions of the event, suitable for disabled people. Yeah, because... There are a lot of locations the now. Things, yeah. yeah, a lot of locations now, you know, have to be uh, dis- disability accessible. Yeah. Mm. You know, they have had to put in disabled toilets and things like that to make it accessible for the disabled people. Old locations, not so much because obviously they're restricted in regards to the actual building, and it does depend, I think, on the level of the building. So if it's a Grade One listed. There's only so much they can do to the internal side of things, isn't there? A- absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah. somewhere like Kelvin and Hatch, for example, it is impossible to make that place <laughs> suitable for people in wheelchairs. I mean, crutches, not so bad. But um, wheelchairs is a, is a no-go, I don't think. It yeah. becomes um, an issue, doesn't it? But I've, I've been to museums before where they've had... You could go in and, although we haven't used them or anything, they have got, like wheelchair lifts yeah to go mm-hmm. up a few stairs um and things like that so obviously they are <laughs> suitable for people in wheelchairs mm-hmm. um you know so it just again that that's another thing that i'd say you know you can ask about as well but yeah if you if you've got questions any reputable business will be able to provide you answers and if they can't they'll be able to go away find the answers and come back yeah so don't be afraid to ask the questions, guys, of any event you may or may not be booking on to, may or may not, may be booking on to, for the future as we open up, what investigations are going to start back up again. Oh, no, um, I'll tell you what, no, don't, don't worry about that. Just come on mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask another question on the table here for you guys. Has there ever been a point where you've wanted to walk away from the field? Plenty. Uh, for me, not so much. I mean, there was a point I wasn't sort of like involved for a long time, but that was more down to family commitments and sort of life. But, but generally, no, that, that would be my answer to that. I mean, you know, I just let the others, if they want to argue and stuff, just let them get on with it. That doesn't really tend to affect me. Yeah, I've, I've had a few times. Yeah, and I think um, into the second lockdown, I actually said to my team, "Look, I really can't be doing with the arguing you're doing. I can't be doing with the arguing that everyone else is doing. I'm just going to concentrate on my own thing. You know, we'll stay a group of friends that occasionally go out on an investigation, but I'm not doing these anymore. I can't be bothered with the hassle. And to a point, I I walked away from it." Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously I'm still doing the show and everything else. I've still kept in the circles. Um, but I'm once lockdown's over, I've already got two events this year. Um, one at RAF Next Head and Kelvin Hatch, assuming the Next Head is still safe enough to go on head on. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and next year I'm looking into doing a couple more events um with another couple of teams as a group share so i'm thinking of shifting from a team to maybe some sort of like paranormal club that people can join and i would arrange these at big locations they can all chip in a bit to pay for it 
and it's sort of like the Thomas Cook of the paranormal world, really. <laughs> <laughs> I put I put all these packages together, and then when the location's paid for and everything, I just go, look, there you go. Maybe it's for more seasoned paranormal investigations, uh, investigators or something. And it's just like, there's your, there's your big castle, crack on, I'll see you at the end sort of thing. That, that's what I'm thinking about doing at the moment. Yeah. I think it just that, sort of takes the hassle did, out of it. I would say that, I wouldn't say I've walked away. I would say I've changed my um, my experience, you know, my paranormal experience when it's got too much. Like I've stopped looking at the socials. I've stopped yeah. doing that sort of thing. I've I've then gone back to basics like reading books and watching documentaries rather than paranormal ghost hunts. Do you know yes. what I mean? So I would say that whenever I felt like I've wanted to leave the field, I've just changed my direction, and that's reaffirmed my passion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that I, I must sense. admit, I've, I've done that as well. Um, I've started reading more. Um, for Christmas, I've got a Kindle, so I've got quite a few books on that that I'm going mm-hmm. through. Um, you know, and, yeah, I've got a few audio books as well that I'm listening to. <laughs> there's some a phenomenal research that has been done and experiences that people have had that aren't really like hitting the paranormal field per se you know we talk about um various things with the guest we were supposed to have tonight was graham phillips we will pin him down i trust trust us we will pin him <laughs> down bless him um who've done a lot of psychic questing back yeah, into the day. Yeah. you know what i mean the experiences that they had you know written down in a book that is really enjoyable to read. It's pure paranormal experience from somebody's personal account. Do you know what I mean? But there's a lot of other research that's been done. My head's going to Eddie Brazil and the the definitive guide to Borley Rectory. Yeah. The research that was done on that, the, um, the Rosalie case, uh, the Harry Price case that was researched by Paul Adams and Eddie Brazil again, um, going through onto the case of Rosalie. That was a famous case that we all, they did a lot of work, a lot of ground-breaking foot research, Mm. you know, on those cases. They're out there. That information is out there if you dig enough and go off your computer. If you get off your computer and actually start looking around and finding these books, sometimes they're difficult, you know, but reference books are really good for reigniting your passion i've got the hans holzer, hans holzer book of ghosts i don't think much of the series but i do think that book's quite a good reference book for going through and, and reading yeah. hans you know holzer stuff is good yeah for that. yeah as i said I i'm not so worried about the tv program on that one but the book itself you know there's so much out there that has been re- properly researched by proper academics. You know what I mean? That it's important to get beyond your t- your computer screen, right? And oh, it, it, it doesn't is. necessarily lead into paranormal um, things anyway. I mean, you, you could be like researching, I don't know, why people see ghosts, mm. but then you could end up reading a book about the brain. Yeah. Totally. That's right, yeah. You know, um, yeah. I've, I've actually... I, Oh, there was a program I was watching earlier today, actually, that actually made me think about um, why animals appear they see spirit. But it's more the case of they're actually staring at one place. Um, a lot of people put that down to um, seeing something that isn't there. Mm. But after this program I was watching earlier, um, apparently there's a... Um, a syndrome called stargazer syndrome. Okay. And I'm looking into that, and it is literally, a, it's a precursor to epilepsy in animals. Oh, okay, oh, yeah. I, I see, yeah. That so, sense. yeah, it's almost like, you know, when we get, there, there is like a ep- level of ep- epilepsy where in the human we would just stare. Yeah. Go off know, into a little word of our own. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's sort of like the, the lower form of epilepsy. Well, the same happens in animals. The vets call it stargazer syndrome. Right. So, so I'm no looking into thing. that. Yeah, I'm looking into that at the moment um, and trying to understand it. And I want to write it up in a blog. 
yeah for the, for the book mm. for our next book um just to give people more of an idea of what it is you know how you can tell it from something else at all you know and maybe a lot of it is where where animals are staring thinking that and you're thinking they're seeing a spirit well actually it could be something more medical for them mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. i want to write a blog on how people can recognize it um and hopefully you know get oh. get more animals treated and not assuming that they're right because they're just seeing a ghost <laughs> <laughs> But there are various things. I think one of the best books, going back to um, books for understanding how humans work, was I've got this. Um, it's quite an academic book. It's a bit of a hard read at times um, because it is so in depth. But it's a psychology book. Yeah. Understanding various things. You know, I learned a lot about the human psyche through that. Yeah. Um, reading that book, and that's nothing to do with the paranormal. That's just humans. Yeah. You know, how our body works, how our brains work, you know, levels of brains and looking at some of the great psychologists like Freud and Jung and stuff like that. And although actually Jung is very interesting to read because some of what he experiences in his personal exploration of his own mind in regard to psychology is very paranormal. Yeah. When you think about um, spiritual journeys and you're coming across archetypal types and stuff like that, it's incredible when you start reading about it and it does start make you thinking. Mm. You know, and, and I think books like that are so important. And like you say, they take you down into avenues. You wouldn't necessarily, you know, ex, you know, expect to go. I remember spending, I think I've talked about this before now, I spent a whole evening one night researching glass manufacture. Yeah. to see if it would help, uh, whether it would emit or transmit, should I say, um, EMF field. Mm. And it turned out that the old, old, old glass, when they were hand-making glass, yes, because of the content. Yeah. Whereas well, now it's a lot more refined and there's a different, you know, it's, it's different nowadays. But mm. old, old glass in some of the old buildings we go to have that property. I didn't know that. Yeah. We were getting an EMF anomaly while we had the machine. It was a data logger rather yeah. than an EMF field. Um, an actual oh, a box thing. We've recorded lots of different things. Graham Smith would know a lot more on that one than I do. Um, yeah. Again, if you want to listen to a show on Graham Smith, a fantastic guy. Um, he, we've done a show with him in the past over on our YouTube channel. Go over there, check that out. And don't forget to click like, share and subscribe. While you're over there, I haven't done that for a while. Live no, it. you haven't. <laughs> that was a blast with the past, wasn't it? But no, yeah. just by using that data logger that you had. Yeah, we that actually was set in a windowsill, weren't it? It was sat yeah, on a windowsill. Yeah, but we we picked up the EMF hits at certain regular intervals, yeah. so we could actually see a pattern yeah. arising. And we worked out that the local train service that mm-hmm. run through was every half an hour. Yeah, and it corresponded with the hits they were getting. Although the train line was how far away, do you reckon? Oh. At least half a football pitch away. Yeah, quite away. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. half a football pitch away. And it still picked up the EMF from that. The a rib, there was through. an actual river in between as well, wasn't there? Yeah. yeah from where was. we were. But the other thing is, we re- we were out one night, early, early days of this, and we were at a bridge. In, Pit, in Pitsy, our local area, you yeah. know, and we've just gone place, out. Yeah. yeah, you know, the place. Yeah. And we were taking photographs of that, and we caught a really weird green mist anomaly, which looked like it had a face in the middle of it, right? Now, uh-huh, that was weird as a photograph. Standalone photograph with no background. You look at it and you go, that's strange. First of all, you've got pareidolia in there. Secondly, before a train comes, they turn the line on. It, it's it's weird. It's not on all the time. Oh, that's right. It comes on sort of like, oh, no, a minute before the train comes through. Oh, yeah. And then when it comes, just when they turn it on, when it triggers or whatever it is, that, some fussy stuff, but when it triggers, it obviously is booting up. So it sends off this, and it charges the water particles in the air, which gave it the green glow 
And yeah. we didn't know none of that until we researched that. Yeah. Yeah. And that came up in a photograph. Now, before we'd researched that, we were like, oh, my God, an amazing capture. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's a phenomenal piece of yeah. paranormal photography right there. So wasn't when we looked at it, when we researched that. So, so you're going into quantum physics as well, then, yeah? Well basic, physics, well, basic physics. Well, oh, basic physics. That, yeah. That's not quantum. That's just basics. But then, if you get into quantum,s it's just like a whole different ball game because you go. I always say, right, it's all well and good having an experience, but the mechanics of it we can't explain. Mm. But they're going so deep into like, like you said, quantum's and stuff like that. I listened to a lecture by Brian Cox and. Throughout the entire lecture, I got what he was saying because he breaks it down into easy, chunkable yes. points. If I come out of there, I couldn't tell you a thing now about mm. quantum. Yeah, at the time, I was thinking, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I get that. Mm. But how he was explaining it and demonstrating as well. He was actually demonstrating this as well at the same time. I kind of understood it. and then, But now, I couldn't repeat that to you if that makes sense. But nuggets yeah. go in. You'd be surprised. Even if you're watching something that you feel is a little bit beyond you or has been broken down to make it understandable, you'd be surprised at the nuggets that do stay with you mm-hmm. through that. I understood it in regards to a grapevine. Yeah. Right, so you, you look at a grapevine and it looks very orderly. It's got all rows and whatnot, doesn't it, when you look at a, a vineyard? Yes. It's all rows and rows, all very neat all lined, all, all patterned. But then you get closer and you look at a closer part of that and you you realise how complicated an individual plant is. Yeah. All... But then you're getting closer and you're getting closer and closer and closer and it becomes more ordered again. And then you get closer, it becomes disorganised. You get closer and it becomes more dis- more organised. And it was he was using that to explain entanglement. Yeah, right. Theory. So when you start looking at that, that made it understand. I'll never forget that analogy now because the closer you get or the deeper you get to something, it like if you look at a paranormal occurrence, you'll look at it closely and think, oh, yeah, that's weird. It looks very ordered. You know, this was pure poltergeist activity. But you look closer and then you look closer again and you you go through those layers of understanding, don't you? Yeah. And the more deeper you go into research on certain topics, if you pinpoint precision your research, then you'll be surprised at what you can find out about that particular topic. Definitely. And that's what makes this field so interesting to me because it's, again, multi-layered in so many different ways. It is. And it's far, far removed from the ghost hunting live stream TV program experience that we yep. we're or is that is heavily criticised. I'm not saying we criticise it. I'm just mm. saying it is heavily criticised. So far away, and you can't equate the two. No, you can't the, equate the two. The people that do are the ghost hunting community on social media. Mm. Well, I don't think they're even looking that far ahead. They can't. They're not. You know, it's just experience, 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 isn't it? Yeah. Except at the end of the day, I I love a good experience, me. Well, yeah. Love a good experience, personal experience. And I've said this time and time again, when you go out in the field, you're out for a personal experience, not for anything more. In regard to deeper research, I know what has to be done. I just can't be asked. (laughs) To, to log all the data and all the, you know, to see the patterns, to try and get some form of understanding. I haven't got the time or the energy for that. Yeah. And yeah, I've not found I mean, you case. Must, you must admit, though, when, when we done the investigation at that gatehouse and we used that data logger. Yeah, it was interesting. That, that was interesting. And we was able to debunk EMF hits. Yeah. Now, if we was just standing there, like so many teams out there with, a K2 meter and we kept getting hits and then we started firing questions at it and then got hits every time we asked a, asked a question. Yeah, yeah. You know, we think we're talking to spirit. Well, actually, because we had the proper equipment and logged it with the data logger, we was actually able to see there was actually a pattern there mm-hmm. and we could tie it to the railway line. 
Uh-huh. After after we tried all the, the other things, because we didn't really pay much attention to the railway line, because we mm-hmm. thought it was so far away it wouldn't have an effect. Mm-hmm. But boy, did that prove us wrong. Oh, it did. Mm-hmm. It certainly did. And it proved another thing that night as well. Mm. We had CCTV running through the entire building. It was quite a small building, I yeah. will grant you, so it was easy to, to have CCTV set up in every area. And we were sitting in the, like, hallway bit, weren't we? Yeah. Yeah. And while we were sitting there, we saw orbs, <coughs> right? Mm-hmm. We know orbs. Are, we know the argument about orbs. And there was still a fraction of the community that say that some orbs cannot be explained by dust, moisture, blah, 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 right? Yeah. But we sat there and we watched these orbs. There was a lot of them. Obviously dust, moisture in the air, insects, right? Obviously. Yeah. But what it did show was the airflow through the building. Yeah. That's what it showed. And in that in itself was invaluable, wasn't it? It was, absolutely. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was an open building anyway. I mean, okay, you had, like, a front door and back door. But as you go up to the roof, the stairs went up and up and up straight onto the roof. Yes, they did. So it had an open roof sort of thing. So... When it rained, all it went it went straight into the basement, all the mm-hmm. way down the stairs into the basement and flooded yeah. that constantly. Um, so yeah, you'd have a constant airflow through that building, and it showed the airflow. This mm. night was a clear, quite a still night, but yeah. it did show that airflow through the building. So that in itself was useful, not because we were getting multiple orbs. Woohoo, spirit! <laughs> nah, it just showed the airflow through the building. So. When we was looking at temperature variations, mm-hmm. it opened up a whole different world in regards to that, didn't it? It did. And, you know, that that's the beauty of actually doing the proper research on it as opposed to the ghost hunting stuff. But like I say, I see them as two completely different fields. Mm. Mm. There's one I will watch without engaging my brain and yeah. just enjoy it for what it is. Do you know what I mean? The freaks mm. and the scares and the, oh, my God, and the, oh, this came up on the phone app that I'm using or whatever it be. Yeah. Having said that, even that, we've had some strange experiences with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can't sit here and say I haven't. Two or yeah. three times when I've used a phone app, and I I don't believe in a phone app at all. I've got no... no um, confidence shall we say in phone apps no disrespect to anybody who does you know that's just my personal opinion but i have had some strange experiences whilst using one Mm. you know things that have come up have been very relevant to what i was doing and i wasn't in a haunted location i was at my house working with an object and i had some really strange things come through what i wouldn't expect Mm. come through on the phone you know the phone app thing Whilst yeah. we were doing a live on air thing, my TV turned on full blast. Never had that before. Never had it since. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I can't say they're paranormal activity. I don't know how that happened. It could be just pure coincidence. Yeah. Could be. I don't know. Then again, we've said this before. As people become more modern, more modern people pass over. Technology isn't a stranger to us now like it would have been back in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's not. If you're a ghost and you're trying to communicate, you kind of know what a computer is. You know what a um, a phone app is. You know a phone inside out because it's completely welded to your hand 24-7, most people these days. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You know these, you know these pieces of tech that people are using. Yeah. They're not a stranger to you, so you're more likely, if you are a spirit and you are able to affect those kind of things, utilise that, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, of course, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> That's if it is what it is, you know. If that is what it is. Mm. But then we go back down to the psychology of things, don't we, and how we jump to assumptions based on the limited information that we're given. And then that brings us full circle in a funny way as to how people make jumps of assumption in regards to making up conspiracy theories. Yeah. Lean conspiracy theories. And then we come into things like 
con- confirmation bias. Yeah. You always automatically, whether or not you recognise it within yourself or not, lean to what it is that your belief system is driving. Well, of course, yeah, it's confirmation bias. It's it's a well-known uh, psychological uh, thing we do as humans. It is, definitely. So, let's talk more modern, because we're coming to the, like, the last 20-odd minutes of the show. What's on your table at the moment? What books are on your table? What influences are on your table? Where are you going in your own personal journey? Because over the last six months, I've seen it, you know, at one point... We all were doing the same thing at the same time. Now we've we've all branched off into different areas a little bit more, mainly because we haven't had to get together. Yeah, that's yeah. right. We've well, been more secular. Well, with me, as you know, I've been going clear, clearing out some of my books, which I've put some on eBay. But uh, I found one which I didn't think I actually had, and uh, you actually mentioned it earlier, Kerry, uh, Colin Wilson's book on poltergeists so i'm gonna settle down and uh go through that and uh i i know you think very highly of it so Mm -hmm. i thought that's good enough uh recommendation for me but no i and i actually found it the other day so i'm gonna sit back and um read that sort of get and get back to basics do some good old-fashioned reading of books yeah yeah I've I've been ploughing through. I love Colin Wilson. I put that out there. I love his work. Mm-hmm. Um, in regards to, you know, he brings lots of different um, cases to the table to give you a rounded. Um, his book Supernatural is brilliant because yeah. it gives you a chapter on different things, but gives you lots of different cases that give you both sides of the argument. Yeah. On it. So I really um, and also historical facts are in there where things come from, you know, ideas, things, all sorts of things he'll bring to the table to give you a broader understanding of that particular topic and gives you lots of threads. So you think, oh, that's interesting. I'll look into that a bit deeper. You know, that's really interesting. That's what I like about Colin Wilson. Paul, what's on your table? Um, Well, other than um, work, doing a lot of work for St. John and during the vaccination program, um, we, we've taken on nearly 30,000 volunteers, um, all of which had to be interviewed. I was one of the interviewers. Um, but now that's that's all finished. Um, I'm actually helping and supporting some of the vaccinators with all their tech issues and um, helping them get their shifts um, and stuff like that. So I'm helping in, in that area at the moment. Um, and I, I've sort of not i've had a bit of a break from the paranormal um i decided to take up um making resin things um and i've actually got my first order in (laughs) oh have you yeah yeah my mum asked me to do um a pyramid she wanted me to do a pyramid but um where my granddad died she planted um an orange rose bush in the garden so it's his rose bush Mm. Um, and she wants me to um, do an orange rose in the centre of the pyramid mm-hmm. um, as a, you know, just a reminder of, of my granddad sort of thing. Yeah. So I've got a plan of what I want to do, um, and she wants me to make one of those. So I've started taking orders now. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Oh. Yeah. Charge a £900 for the privilege. Obviously, really. £900 yeah. pounds for the privilege. <laughs> Um, yeah, so no, I've started practicing with that, and it's going all right so far. So I'll, I'll start selling bits and pieces soon. Um, but I've, again, you know, not only that, I'm, I'm still researching in the paranormal for the blogs and the shows and things. Um, and yeah, I'm looking into vet, vets and stargazing syndrome now, mm-hmm. and and reading horror books. At the moment, I'm reading Richard Layman's The Cellar. Oh, spooky nice. stuff. Yeah. It's part of the Beast House collection. Richard actually got scared the other night watching a scary movie. Oh, oh what uh, one was that? I've been watching or trying to watch uh, the Haunted series on Netflix. And 
Yeah. One of them was actually quite disturbing. I was watching, and you know, it was, and it was getting to the stage. It was getting very jumpy, you know. And I, and I'm not very good when I watch films like that. So I actually <laughs> still don't know what quite happened at the end. <laughs> oh. I Skyped him in the middle of it. That. He went, oh, I goes, I'm glad you phoned. He said, like, I was getting scared. I was like, what on earth are you doing? It was that childish sort of scary feeling, you know, when, you know, watching something on TV um, when you're a kid that used to scare you. I don't know. It was sort of that sort of thing. But there you go. Uh, and I've obviously, I've obviously still got it in me. So, yeah. I must admit, when I first watched, I, I, I think I was about 12 when it came out on the telly, um, Ghost Watch mm. on the, in the UK. Yeah. Um, it was like a precursor to all the paranormal TV shows they've got now. Yeah. But it was totally faked. But it was done realistically. Yeah. Um, and as, as a 12-year-old, that really scared the life out of me so much, I would watch it until it scared me and then I'd turn over. And then I go back after about five minutes and watch another bit and then turn back over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that that could have mentally scarred me if I watched all that, I reckon. But there, there was quite a lot of people that were really disturbed by that show. And I do believe one person or well, a few people committed suicide over it. Really? Yeah, yeah. What I remember reading one person in the news that actually wrote a letter saying after watching ghost watch i know there's an afterlife so i will see you on the other side oh right. <laughs> yeah gosh that's not good is it no well i've been re-embracing my spiritual side and my crystal work which have been neglected for far too long um so i picked that the reins of that back up and i've been doing various workshops with people and actually surprising myself at my own knowledge <laughs> in that way um, and working with crystals again which I always take into the paranormal field so I've been looking at sacred geometry and those sort of things so it's very interesting I'm um, delving back into that field again which is one of the reasons why I got into the paranormal in the first place um, is what I've been doing now, over on our website, paranormalconcept.com, we have been writing blogs. We've been having a little blog off um, amongst ourselves. Um, and we started off back in January with the power of three, which kind of looked at why we have the power of three and, and what makes us work so well as a trio on a show. Well, yeah. Yeah. And um, where, where's it got to now? We have gone through, I'll go, this shows you how, how weird and wonderful our brains work, I think is the expression. Paul then went on to the three as the magic number and looked more into the mythology of the of three, of the number three. Then uh, <laughs> Richard ignored that and just went Richard off went off own. into belief in the paranormal. <laughs> he went off on a totally different um, avenue yeah. on that one, bless him. Then I went down into belief systems. So we can keep carrying on with the belief thing, went into belief systems. Paul took that and ended up talking about incubus and succubus. How the hell did that happen? We're going to have to go and read the blogs to find out. From there, I went to Away with the Fairies. That was me, yeah. Was that you with Away with yeah. the Fairies? Away oh, with yeah, because the then I went into Wayland Smith. Yep. Then Paul took Wayland Smith and ended up talking about Tolkien. Tolkien, yeah. Lord of the Rings fame. And from Tolkien, we went to the Angel of the Mon. Angel of Mons. Yes, First World War. <laughs> yeah. So you can see how um, a conversation via blog takes shape and moves through and goes in very many different areas. So if you want to have a read of those, go over to paranormalconcept.com. As you can see, we cover a wide variety of topics and... <laughs> <laughs> avenues I think is the expression you've got lots of different um, ideas and what not going on through those blogs more to come very very soon on those but it just goes to show how the three of us think very differently and take things in different angles and okay. sometimes when we have late night skypes this is one of the um, when we try to pin down topics for shows this 
this is um causes a little bit of a I'm not doing that and how about this and oh my god that concept is a big one but we do enjoy the concept side of it don't we guys we do well, of course yeah. we do yeah that's what makes the show what it is it yeah does. And, and it just flows so into so many different areas Definitely. you know the paranormal isn't just one thing it, it, you know it's such a it's such a broad canvas and this is what we I will hopefully try and bring to the table even though we do talk sometimes and people may think well what's paranormal about this i mean you know just just look at it again you know we relate it back to the paranormal <laughs> yeah. in many different areas even down to historical reference, you know, when we was talking about the World Wars recently, yeah, um, back on either side of VE Day. Um, yeah, but then, as as I said earlier, you know, when when people's dogs stare into space, and you think they're seeing spirit. Well, yeah, well, there's probably a lot know, of people now, that probably think that, isn't it? Because, because of that, I'm now looking into the physiology of dogs' brains. Yeah. How cool is that? <laughs> I know. It's just amazing the avenues it does lead you down sometimes. And as I say, sometimes you'll sit there and you'll spend a night or a day or whatever, or a few hours researching something, um, you know, that you think was paranormal that isn't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah you know, okay. I ended up one night I was looking at something. I, I, I think this was to do with the EMF side of things. And they thought that birds migrated and um, because they could um, sense the um, the Earth's electromagnetic field, so they could yeah. follow the the I don't know the lines or whatever it was. I can't remember now. But now they don't think it was. It's to do with that that linked to a protein in their eye that uh, it was something to do with because they have two lids, don't they? Yeah. It was something to do with that. It was a long time ago. I looked at that, um, but. I was looking into bird eyes at one point, really weird stuff that you end up researching that you never, ever thought you would end up researching. (laughs) But that gives you a fantastic, grounded, all over knowledge base, not just to do with the paranormal, which you can bring into the paranormal for various experiments and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'd be surprised, you know, where that might lead you in regard to experimentation. You know, just talking amongst yourselves with people, like-minded people can bring up some fantastic ideas. We quite often sit with Vivian Powell. One night they were out investigating. Why can't you use the phone in a paranormal investigation? They did. They tried it. Amazing response to that. Still can't explain that. And we've been in touch with phone companies and God knows who. And we've talked about that on a show before now. Exactly. You know, various teams we talk to, um, some of the ideas they come up with, and the the knowledge as well. When you start talking, you think you think I didn't, I'd research that thought, I'd research that endlessly. Somebody comes up with another nugget of information and leads you down another rabbit hole. Yeah. You know, uh, it's just it, it almost goes from a rabbit hole to termite mound. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally, and you go off different angles, and you have to go. No, I'm not researching that. I'm yeah. researching this at the moment. I'll hold that for another day. I have a list, a list of things that um, I want to look deeper into that I've not had a chance to do so yet. But that's what I find so fascinating about the paranormal. It's not necessarily always necessarily the paranormal occurrence that I'm researching. It'll be the the extra bits where it leads you to yeah. that I find fascinating. <sighs> well, I always say you'll find the devil in the detail, won't they? Yep. Well, there is an expression. Yes. <laughs> now, on a previous show, we were talking about, I think it was superstitions at one point, and we said, why do we um, wish people break a leg in a theatre? Do you remember that discussion, guys? Yes. Yeah. Right, And we couldn't remember the reason why it's break a leg and not good luck. Yeah. It's because it tempts the fates. To wish somebody luck or, or, you know, that tempts the fate so they won't get the luck they need or they won't get the the performance they, they're putting out there. So you wish the opposite so it doesn't tempt the fate into making them have a bad performance. Oh, right. Okay. Found out that little nugget earlier. Awesome. Mm-hmm. 
which was a little, I wasn't even looking at that. I was looking for something completely different to that, and that popped up, and I was like, oh, I know the answer to that now. Yeah, we'll have to look into more superstitions, I think, and uh, do another show on it. That was interesting when we did the maritime one, wasn't it? Yeah. But again, even with the shows, it is phenomenal, the the variety and different, you know, we've we've done historic shows, we've done mythical shows, we've done, you know, um, we've had many guests on the show talking about different cases or different things that have gone on. And it's just the whole wide world of the paranormal is such a broad spectrum and you shouldn't pinpoint yourself into one area. Focus on your lane. Do what makes you keep the passion for the field that you entered in. Because you started with passion. You don't want to lose that through no. the, through the actions of others, basically. Keep your passion. Keep researching. Keep learning. And that's the beauty of the paranormal. And on that note, we've actually come to the end of the show, guys. I know. Good show, eh? <laughs> Considering it's off the top of our heads. <laughs> Not a bad for a free-flowing show, right? <laughs> No, that's right. We've had heated moments. We've had fun moments. We've had all sorts in this show tonight. On that note, we're going to bid you a very farewell. Please join us next week. We have got, and I can guarantee this one will happen, the best person in the world joining us on the show next week. And if you want a fun field show, next week is definitely going to be a bit of that. (laughs) (laughs) Say good night, guys. Good night, night, guys. guys.